Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, so the, the presentation is on uncertainty and um, after four years out of academia, my first presentation to a conference, I'm feeling rather uncertain this morning. So please bear with me. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, a uh, special greeting to our friends down in Te Waipanamu uh, and to the, uh, my colleagues that are in the Auckland Hub at the moment. So um, I'm presenting to a, a group of people here, uh, but also very much acknowledge that uh, I have colleagues and friends throughout the country. So thank you uh, for inviting me to speak uh, to you today. Um, one of the, um, well, the central issue that I want to address is, is how uh, we deal with or how we can use learning outside the classroom uh, to help us, uh, to help our young people to not just deal with uncertainty, but to thrive in uncertain times. So um, what I'm going to do today is just run through a brief um, overview, uh, look at you know, what is the situation we find ourselves in, um, why dealing with uncertainty is important, and how as uh, outdoor educators or people involved in facilitating learning outside the classroom, we can uh, use adventure to equip and uh, really encourage our young people to be able to uh, understand how to navigate their way in a constantly changing world. And then I'm going to look very briefly at the adventurous learning framework. So that's the plan for today. Um, I was in a Zoom conference with some colleagues uh, recently um, and this one came from a, a colleague in Canada. This is their uh, preparation for their canoeing trip with social distancing. Um, so she shared it with us, and I thought it was interesting, not only are they not on the water, uh, but they've made sure that they've spaced themselves far apart. And um, we are uh, in a unique situation here in that we can actually do some activities with our students. So my colleagues in uh, Europe and Canada, and this is, uh, just a recent photograph, but have not been able to get out with their students since March. So um, I just thought I'd brighten it with a photograph and say, actually, whilst things are uncertain here, they are better perhaps than some other places. So just a bit of a backdrop. Um, there has been, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but one of the things about modern society, and when I talk about modern society, I don't want to get too particular, too theoretical about it, but there has been a really strong push to be able to quantify and predict. Um, so if you think about the scientific method, uh, the fact that we want to know things, um, we want to be able to predict, um, and if you look at uh, education system, not just in New Zealand but overseas often when we have prescribed learning outcomes. If you know about some of the uh, movements in the, certainly in the United States, um, you'll find that there's very much a, a rationalisation because as teachers often uh, we are disempowered and we are told what we're doing at a particular time in a particular day. And I know New Zealand is a little bit different, but in other contexts, this push for quantification and predictability has permeated not just um, industry, but also the education system. So against that backdrop, we find ourselves in a world where there are things that we cannot control. So things like global warming, those of you that are a little bit older and a bit greyer like myself will have grown up in a time when um, we were worried about a nuclear holocaust. And so there was this, this notion that there were things that were so bad um, that we could not do anything about them on a global scale. So what we tried to do was control the things we could control. And that's, I guess, part of uh, Beck's work on the risk society. We um, uh, try and control those things. We minimise what he called the minimising the bads. Um, so... Uh, we've seen this rise of the, um, the notion of risk and risk management and managing those things that we can control. Right? And I think we see that and it permeates our society. If you think about the ads, uh, I remember there was one on television a few years ago. It was about a mother and a child, young child went to the bathroom and of course the child comes out of the bathroom and there's little germs that are these little bubbles coming off the kid's hands, you might remember that. And therefore you needed to put hand sanitizer so the child could wash their hands. And so the, the implicit message was that if you're a good mother, you'll make sure your child's hands are clean. Because bad mothers are those that don't minimize the risks of some sort of cross infection. It's the same thing, most, many of us would have uh, ridden our bikes or walked to school, Nowadays, there's a great desire to drive our children to school because something terrible could happen on the way to school. 
This is this notion of minimising the bads. Um, the, the other work that um, I guess is quite influential is uh, Faridi's work on this culture of fear, and he developed a principle called the precautionary principle. So um, the idea is that uh, if you don't know what the outcome of something is going to be, you should always take the cautious approach. Right? And so he uh, developed this thesis uh, quite extensively. Um, but essentially, we, we even get to the stage where we are suspicious about the solutions. Right? So if something bad is happening, there is a potential solution, but if we can't know the solution in its entirety, we're not going to actually go for the solution. And I think that will be interesting to see how this has played out in the COVID vaccine. So, um, you know, this notion of a precautionary principle, don't do something if you don't know the outcome. So that's sort of the, the, the backdrop, um, if you like. So against that sort of, th there is also this notion that whilst we've tried to predict the world, and I think we see this in, if you like, what we call the culture wars. So we see in some, I'm not going to name the countries, but there's the rise of the right. right? So there's conservative politicians because they have the truth or they have the answer, and people are seeking that because we live in complex, insecure, and uncertain times. So um, what I've suggested here is that, or what we argue in, in, the, in the work that I've done with Simon uh, Beams in Adventurous Learning, is that we actually are in a world where it is complex, it's always going to be insecure, and it's constantly changing. And in the face of that, we have the option to embrace that and go with it and learn how to adapt or we can revert to something that's in the romantic past. And I think if you look around some of the uh, European and certainly a particular North American country, you'll find that when dealing with uncertainty in a complex world, certain people will try and vote in a particular way to return them to the romantic past. Some of you will come across this term um, of VUCA, uh, which is about volatility uh, and uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity, which characterise the modern world. So gone are those linear relationships of cause and effect. And um, you know, there's a whole body of work which talks about um, this notion that you know, we are constantly in a flux. So those of you who want to explore these ideas further, uh, there are some frameworks for you uh, to have a, have a think about. So even if we understand or so we know that we're in a complex world. And I think this year has been uh, a very uh, powerful example of the complexity um, and the new reality we live in. We know that. Okay? But there's a difference between knowing that and understanding that this is not just a temporary situation we find ourselves in. So, for example, if you're uh, working in... Um, a manufacturing industry, your job, you might have lost your job and the job's gone offshore because it can produce cheaper in another country. So you know and you're disenfranchised and you are upset about the economic reality. So therefore you might vote for a government that, which is arguing to bring jobs back to New Zealand. So you know what the issue is, but unless you understand globalisation, then uh, your actions actually aren't going to address the root cause of the problem. Right? So what we need to do is, is move beyond just knowing uh, and, and trying to understand the world that we live in and having an understanding that it's going to be like this, how do we prepare um, to, uh, to not just um, survive but to thrive? And that's what I, I think we have something to offer. So where do we fit in? Um, enough of the sort of sociological social theory. Uh, we are outdoor educators uh, or people who are engaged in learning outside the classroom. Some of the things around modernity have impacted on us as well. So there is a reasonable body of literature which has indicated that in many ways the, um, the revolutionary approach that we took to learning outside the classroom, to getting young people out into the hills, to doing all these things with them, um, the alternative uh, form of education has actually become under the grip and the rationalisation that 
is experienced in other aspects of our society and also in education. So many of us will be frustrated and feel constrained by the timelines that we work in inside the school. So the bell goes or there's a certain time for a, a class or if you're in the university system with the lectures and you've got to fit your, st your, your work into that. Likewise, um, you know, if we are experiential educators and we're learner-centred, how do we write uh, some learning outcomes which prescribe what the learner is going to know at the end of it when we don't know that because it's student-led? So we find ourselves in this conflicting situation where we have to sort of fit in to the organisational regime in which we work. Um, many of you um, will have taken your students to uh, environments in which uh, what I would term as fabricated adventures are offered. So students uh, are um, put into perhaps something like a challenge ropes course um, and in those situations where height is involved there's very stringent safety guidelines, very strong risk management, management procedures around that and very often as a teacher or an educator when you go there unless you are qualified on that particular course you are sidelined. You don't get the opportunity to actually engage with your students. You become a spectator. And so in that, what's sold as an adventure and sold as leadership is often not so much an adventure. Right? So opportunity for students to be creative, to think outside the box, and heaven forbid trial and error, because we can't have students trying things when they're 10 metres off the ground, and if they try something and it's not the correct thing, then the consequences are too high. So the things that are sold as adventure are not always uh, particularly adventurous. And then um, the final one is that uh, what should be a, um, an environment of equality often turns into the, the power differentials that we see uh, exhibited in many classrooms. So the expert knower who tells somebody where to stand, what to do or not, don't do this, and the novice, the student. So um, I don't want to dwell too much on that, but I think uh, unfortunately uh, we have been dragged into this um, commodification. So um, what I want to present now, now that I've just spent a little bit of time there, is talking about rethinking adventure. We have something to offer our colleagues in mainstream education and more importantly we have something to offer our students. Um, and I think we can do that if we reclaim what we mean by adventure. Okay, so um, that's the great news, the good news if you like, is that, that we have something very powerful uh, at our disposal. And what uh, Simon, of I, Simon Beams and I have done is we have advocated for um, adventure having four components. So adventure means many things to many people. Um, adventure is used to sell bungee jumping, it's used to sell particular holidays, it's used to sell motor vehicles, it's used to sell tourism. Okay? And many of those things are not adventure and I don't want to unpack them now, um, but um, by looking at what we call the four um, dimensions, and I'm going to go through those very briefly now, then we can reclaim adventure and help our students to deal with uncertainty and to thrive. So the dimensions are authenticity, agency and responsibility, uncertainty and mastery through challenge. So I'm just going to go through those briefly uh, now. So um, the first dimension is authenticity. And um, so this is where we try and engage students in activities, in environments which are related to the everyday life. Right? Um, authentic activities involve commitment and time and effort on the part of the participant. Right? Um, and if you think about it, some of you are probably quite good in your garage uh, building things. So, you know, you might fabricate some furniture, right? So to be, to be able to make a chair requires time and commitment and effort on your part to build something, excuse me, which you would argue would be authentic, okay? So, um, you know, these are not limited, the notion of authenticity is not limited uh, purely to uh, the outdoors, but I think we understand what something that is authentic looks like. It also responds to place, community and culture. So, so the question would be, what can be learned in this particular environment? 
Okay? Whose place is this? Okay? What, uh, what are acceptable? What could I do? Who's dwelt here in the past? And some of you will know uh, that some of those questions I'm asking relate to what um, could be termed a place responsive approach. The other thing about authentic activities is they don't rely on contested notions of transfer. So you, you don't have to take s young people away and take them off to some remote wilderness environment and then struggle to facilitate their connections back to their home place or their workplace because you're starting to do those activities in the places which have meaning to them in the first place. So those of you that are into facilitation and know about isomorphs, right, where you construct some magical story to connect people from their outdoor experience to their everyday, you don't have to worry about that. Okay, because people are in their everyday. So authenticity of activity, connections to culture and places is a fundamental touchstone of adventurous learning. The other aspect is what we refer to as agency and responsibility. So agency is the ability to make a choice and act on that. So it's about providing opportunities for students to be able to influence what they want to learn and how it's learned and for them to take responsibilities for what they've, for what they've learned. Right? Now there are certain activities, if we focus on activities, we cannot expect a person who's going to a challenge ropes course for the first time to take responsibility. And I think we all know deep down that we set up um, risk management procedures in such a way the students know that if they let the rope go, it's not actually a big deal. Because they know that there's an instructor over there who doesn't want any harm to come to them. And so we manufacture and we set up such a good safety systems that students really know that the responsibility level is, is, not, is not there. Okay? Um, we need to provide, as educators, appropriate opportunities for students to develop autonomy. And we need to be able to support them to make meaningful choices. And by meaningful choice, we need to create or have a situation where students know that if they take this choice, this is the course of action and they have to bear the responsibility. So the types of choices we offer our students should be meaningful. They shouldn't be what we call pseudo choices. Choice is good, right? It's good to give your students choice, but relevance of the choices they make is better. So for example, if you're going on a canoeing trip down the Waikato River, to say to the students, okay, so when do we want lunch? Do we want it at half past 12 or, or, or one o'clock? It's not really a choice. So those are pseudo choices. So what we have to be able to do is to create environments where students know that they have a choice, and if they take that choice, they will be supported. And it's a challenge for us because we need to have trust in the process and create an environment where if a student says they want to do this or a group of students want to do a particular activity or, or a pathway, we need to be able to support them and not undermine them. Because as soon as you start undermining them, then they understand that they don't have real choice in this. We also need to give students the right type of choices. Okay? So they need to be choices around uh, that involve the cognitive as well as just what I, we call the organisational. Right? So this, th I mean, I could do a half hour just on this, so I've sort of got to move on, move on from that. But it does connect with self-determination theory. Um, so there's a strong body of evidence that says that one of the greatest things we can give our young people is the ability to exercise agency and take responsibility for their actions. Yep. Now, we can't expect... Um, people to take responsibility for their actions if they don't have some command of what they're doing, some skills, and I'll come back to that in a minute. The other one, the other component, the third component here is uncertainty. Okay. So, so uncertainty is not the same as risk. So what we advocate is that we need to think about the process. So the process for the students to get from A to B can be they can have multiple pathways. So there's uncertainty in the process. There's no one right answer. They might go off on a tangent. They may be creative. Okay? So um, uncertainty allows students to demonstrate imaginative thinking 
and to be creative. And if you think about many of the activities that we do, which involve height, uh, steep ground or fast moving water, we cannot give students the opportunity to be creative because the consequences of not getting that right can be catastrophic. Now, the use of uncertainty in education has some really strong background. So John Dewey, who's often known as the father figure of experiential learning, talked about indeterminate situations. Sir Ken Robinson, who unfortunately passed away recently, many of you know his work from his TED talk, you know, he talked about the powers of crea creativity. So we need to have some sort of uncertainty because if you know, the, the saying goes, you know, learning is what you do when you don't know what to do. So this element of uncertainty is really important to um, assist our students to develop deeper reasoning and innovation. And there has been a, um, a body of work which says it's okay to acknowledge you don't know what you're doing. Yep. It's okay to be uncertain. We are all uncertain at particular times. We face that on a day-to-day -day basis. Now that that's the situation, it's the norm, how am I going to deal with it? So we need to foster these opportunities for students to think for themselves, to be creative. Now, the, the elements that I've talked about so far in terms of agency and taking responsibility, you can't expect somebody who doesn't have skill to be able to be able to make an informed choice. If you take a young person rock climbing for the first time, it's not fair and reasonable to expect them to lead climb because they don't have the skill. However, there is the opportunity to be able to develop mastery. So one of the things that through adventure is that you can give students challenges that allows them to get better. And unfortunately, I think one of the things that we have done and undersold ourselves in this area is we have too often gone for a smorgasbord on our camps and we've done a series of activities. So you've gone away for three days and you've done six activities or seven activities. The students never get good at anything. Right? And well, I know the argument is that they can try this and try that, but they don't get good. And if you want to look at the literature on self-esteem and self-efficacy, self-concept, let people be good at something. Give them the skills to be good at something. Many of you who are listening in or here in the room today are good at mountain biking, good at whitewater kayaking or climbing. So you celebrate bodily movement and enjoy being good at something. Let's give our students the opportunity to be good at something, which requires time and commitment, okay? Authentic, authenticity. Let's present them with challenges, challenges that are incremental, okay? Allow them to develop skill, take responsibility. Yep. If we do this right, we set up what we call a virtuous spiral. Students can get good, they want to do more, they want to do more, they want to do more. What Simon and I have done is we've put together these dimensions and sort of, it's not a model, right? But it does allow you, if you wish, to be able to think about um, where your activity fits on these sort of, this sort of diagram. And, oh, there is a, there's a pointer. So for example, you might do raft building and you might say, how much uncertainty is there in raft building and crossing a lake? Well, the students might fall in, so you might mark it somewhere on here. Right? How much agency have the students got? They might have uh, quite a bit of agency, right? So they can take responsibility. How much mastery do they get? Well, actually, you're doing this activity, it's an hour and a half activity, there's not much mastery. So it just gives you a tool to go, well, where am I, where am I positioned here? No right wrongs. And if you think I would like to uh, have a sort of more adventure, you can go, right, so I'm going to take the students away on a three-day trip down the Waikato River, and you can plot against this. If they're canoeing for three days, how good are they going to get? Their mastery levels might go up. Right? If they have to um, be responsible for buying their food and cooking their meals, Right, provided you've given them some skills around that, their agency and responsibility for that aspect of the trip goes up. So you can start to see, you can start playing around with these various dimensions. So I guess one of the hallmarks is that I've never been in favour of models that you have to originally follow. You can pick up on any of those dimensions 
and explore them, you might decide that this is not the time for agency or in, in this particular case. And you might stress authenticity. So um, this might enable you to sit down with your colleagues when you're planning an EOTC outdoor education trip to say, hey, where are we positioned on here? What would it look like if we wanted to move levels of agency and responsibility for our students? So an adventurous learning model fits with a range of approaches to outdoor learning. It could be student-centred journeys, uh, low-tech camping ex experiences, being under canvas on the local farmer's farm, place responsive approaches and cross-curricular approaches. Yep. So there's lots of opportunities. So I think as outdoor educators and outdoor learners, we can reclaim adventure. Right? It opens up space for our students to embrace creativity right? and to deal with uncertainty. It celebrates being good at something and it challenges some of our existing understandings of uh, adventure and outdoor education. Now, um, <clears throat> I've just put up a web page here. So this went live, I think, last week. So adventurouslearning.org, so Simon Beams and I have put together a website so you can find more information about what I've talked about very briefly today. Uh, if you look at it, there is uh, four dimensions, there's some resources, there's some videos embedded in here, uh, which will allow you to explore this further if you wish. So it's at adventurouslearning.org. And that is the book that uh, Simon and I published uh, around adventurous learning, uh, which you uh, can probably get from um, most online book sellers. So I've had um, people in the audience doing five fingers and three fingers and two fingers, and then somebody's gone from two fingers back to five fingers. So I've got multiple timekeepers, but <coughs> um, I've uh, finished there. So there's the opportunity to uh, ask some questions now. So I'm happy to take questions for either one and a half or two minutes. Uh, thanks for that chat, Mike. Um, just on the four elements, and since you guys have uh, released the book, has there any been feedback on elements that have been the trickiest for people to implement in the classroom or with their students? No, we haven't had anybody coming back and saying we're finding this difficult because what we have purposely done is not create a model that you have to adhere to all of those. And so there's the case where you can use the elements that you want and um, put greater emphasis on a particular area. So the, they're just dimensions to think about. So we do know that the, this is being used. Uh, the Ontario uh, uh, State Department or state in, in uh, Canada is using it. Um, but it's not prescriptive. You can pick up what you want and emphasise what you want, when you want, with your learners, because this should be learner-based. Yeah, thanks, Donald. Kia ora, thank you for that. I guess this isn't really a question, but it's an interesting point I was thinking about around our donation scheme, and that's how that's made us reframe our outdoor education programmes. And I just wanted to link what you were talking about with, um, you spoke about your power differentials. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really interesting concept too think about is in the outdoors and how we take our programs really, really place-based and changing our structure to suit our students and not be the font at the front. Yeah, I thought that was really powerful. That's pretty ironic coming from me because I'm standing at the font in the front of the class at the moment. <laughs> Excellent, I've escaped relatively <laughs> unscathed. There might be some on the slideos that come through. Right, okay. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for those people who are listening in from other hubs. Oh. Oh. Do you want to read it out? Uh, this is from Chris. Uncertainty creates challenges for educations for documenting this on paperwork and EOTC proposals. Any advice? Yeah, um, the advice would be to think about um, what it is that you want your students to learn and then think about the activities. I think we've got ourselves trapped on focusing about an activity and then mapping back and saying what people will learn. And I'll give you an example is that often we use a high ropes course and say that students learn leadership. 
Okay, or uh, as a friend's daughter went to a high, uh, to a indoor rock climbing, and she was being marked on um, risk management. Right? Now, how can you let a novice, you know, understand risk management? What happens if she passed that unit? Is somebody is somebody fallen? So let's go back to what we want people to learn, and then think about what we're going to do, and and remove the the um, the, for example, the height out of these things, and therefore when you're doing your paperwork, you don't have to worry about that as much. Now, what I'm not saying is that risk management is not important here, but let's go back to what it is that students can really learn. And um, I know in previous in a previous life in my other academic career, I spoke about place responsive. And you know, I've worked with students from Narawaha High School, and we did, if you like, low risk adventure things. But the students got a heck of a lot out of it, right? So let's not get trapped to think that we have to do adrenaline activities for students to learn, because I don't think the research necessarily bears that out. So. I've got two more questions off the Slido right. from Miss Optimistic. Learning is what happens when you don't know what to do. Yes, some of my colleagues struggle to hand over agency to our students. How can I challenge this? I think the question would be, it's the same question perhaps you would ask parents if you're trying to sell this to, to a parent body or your principal or your colleagues, as, as this person has asked, as if you say to them, would you like this, your student or your son or your daughter to be responsible for their actions? Would you like them to be able to make the right decision or to learn from making a decision and improve upon it? And I think most people are going to say yes. And if you get to that point, then you say, well, actually, here is an approach which will help you to reach that particular outcome. Right? Um, and often change is, is evolutionary rather than revolution. So offer people an alternative which is a positive alternative um, and try and take them on the journey with you. Great, thank you. There's two more questions there, but I think we might do it via the Slido because I think okay. our next keynote will be Excellent. waiting. Thank you so much Thank for you. that, Mike. Thanks. Um, from a <laughs>